worship is at five past eleven. First, here's a personal choice. She's known as the actress who never stops smiling, although some of the roles she plays require her to present a more serious face to the world. Look, I was wondering, it's not such a bad day, you know. Maybe we could take a, a bus into the country, if she's going on. I'm sorry, Ted, I'm busy. Okay, maybe, maybe some other time. Yeah, maybe. Julie Peasgood attributes her unfailing good humour to this historic building in the London suburb of Richmond. Julie, because you're a Buddhist, you've chosen Buddhist songs. Mm. What part do they play in your religion? Well, they're not a daily part of, of um, Buddhism. That we sort of don't sing them every day like you would go, you know, to church on a Sunday and sing hymns. And they all have something in common. They do. They're very life-affirming lyrics. Uh, the songs I've chosen, all with a very positive outlook. You know, very optimistic, which is what our whole faith is about. How long have you been a Buddhist? I started chanting in 1983, so uh, it's 15 years now. Yeah. Now, I know, and you know, we both work in a fairly cynical business. What do your fellow actors and actresses make of all this? They're great about it, actually. Yes, they are. I mean, I chant in the theatre, when I'm in the theatre before um, I do a show, and I do tend to um, go sort of into a little corner and chant. But I'm not... Um, I've never been evangelical. I don't sort of talk about it unless somebody asks me. What was your own religious upbringing? I didn't have a very strong religious upbringing. I mean, I suppose C of E. And I did go to Sunday school, which I hated. I found it really boring. In fact, it most definitely seemed like a, a punishment. OK, let's take a pause for some music, because you've chosen as your first song something called I Know. Now, why have you chosen that? This, I, I love this song. It was written by Phil Sawyer in 1993, and it's his own personal declaration of faith, really. And I've chosen it because uh, the lyrics resonate very much with me. How would I know the sun is gonna shine again next day? I can reach you when you're so far away. I know because my heart tells me so.
Could I talk to you now a little bit about your own family background? I think mm. I'm right in saying you came from a circus family. Yeah, my mum was a tightrope walker in Bertram Mill Circus, mm. yeah, and a juggler. So it was fairly natural, I suppose, for you to want to be, I gather, a ballet dancer, first of all. Yes, I mean, we did do sort of circus tricks on the grass in the summer and all of that, uh, and I love doing that, but no, I, I, I wanted to be a dancer, and I was lucky enough to get into ballet school came down to London when I was 16. But I very quickly realised that I wasn't going to be nearly as good as I needed to be to be a dancer. It was very sort of fortunate that at that particular time I had an accident to my uh, ankle, an injury to my ankle. And uh, I had to give up dancing for three months, which I did. And I filled in uh, in a play at drama school. And it was a bit like a fairy story. An agent came to see the play and wrote to me afterwards, sent me up for a zonking great name above the title lead in a teleplay. And I got it. And, and it was fantastic because it, it sort of, I didn't feel any worries any longer that I, that I didn't sort of have a career path. It was very, very clear from then on what I wanted to do. So how did you get into Buddhism? I got into Buddhism when I was going through a very difficult uh, period in my life personally. Um, I'd been married for eight years and I then met somebody else and I left my marriage and I couldn't come to terms at all with the tremendous guilt that I felt. And I think uh, when you do go through a very difficult period in your life, that's when you can often sort of seek a deeper meaning, you know, why are we here, what's it all about? And that's certainly what happened to me. As, as I say, I just, I just, this guilt obliterated me. It, it crippled me. And so I, first of all, went back to the church. I was in Stratford-upon-Avon at the time. And as I actually reached the church gates, it was extraordinary. They, they clanged shut, very symbolic. And I thought, hmm. I tried three different therapists. I tried hypnotherapy, I tried lots and lots of, of sort of self-help books, and they, they were a help actually. But the thing that really, really was amazing was in the space of a week, I met three different people who told me about Buddhism. One was a stunt man, one was a makeup artist, and the other was um, an Alexander te Technique teacher. And she could sense how terribly low, how, how desolate I felt, and I felt very alienated at that time from everything as well. And she just said, Do you, you know, why don't you try Buddhism? And I actually did think that she meant um, all the men who wear orange robes and walk down, sing down Oxford Street, you know, with the bowls and things. And I thought, oh dear, no, I don't think it's quite for me. And she said, well, come to a meeting, come to a meeting, there's one on Friday. And I went to a meeting and it was the philosophy that really captivated me, why? definitely. Why? What, about, well, what was so special about it? What was so special about it that other churches and hypnotherapy and all those other things you tried couldn't give you? Well, first of all, um, we, we believed that that we are responsible for our own happiness, that you, you don't pray to the outside force, that it's you take responsibility for generating uh, a sort of indestructible life state within. When you chant, you bring forth the Buddha qualities. They are wisdom, courage, compassion, and life force. Do you think you'd have gone for Buddhism, hadn't you, if you hadn't been feeling so fragile? I think, I hope that I would have been lucky enough to have met the philosophy at some point. Um, yes, I probably do, because I was still searching. I think the fact that I was so fragile at that time was a great catalyst. Uh, looking back, it, it really was. And, and I, I, had a bit of a, I had a bit of a problem when they did start chanting. I remember thinking, crumbs, it sounded like a whole herd of wasps. Um, which aren't Nambia Horengekyo. And when a lot of people doing it, and there were a lot of people there are doing it all together, it's an extraordinary uh, thing to witness, first off. And I remember trying to leave the room. I thought, I thought this, isn't, this isn't quite me. I love the philosophy. But there were too many people to step over. So I sat at the back. And then this little voice within said, come on, you've tried, you've spent an awful lot of money trying all these different things, all these different therapies and whatnot. This is, this is, seems to be working for all these people and it's free, you know, so why not give it a go? I mean, the, the money doesn't really have anything to do with it at all, I have to say, but, um, but it was, I, I, I did give it a go very gingerly at the back. And then 
A few days later, I found myself in a situation again, a domestic situation, that kept happening. Uh, and that's where the concept of karma comes in, our tendency again and again to do the same action that has the same effect. And this particular action uh, was really messing things up. And I was aware, it was, it was very early in the morning, and I was aware the whole day was again going to be a nightmare, a travesty. So I remembered, I thought, I can try that chant, I can try that chant. Took myself up to the top of the house, closed the door, and, and looked out at the sky and, and tried Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And I was crying out. First of all, I actually couldn't get the words out. And I tried it. And the more I did it, it actually felt like I had space in my lungs, air within. I, I actually remember a feeling of close on euphoria coming over because it, I, I, just, I just felt released and that actually I didn't have to behave in that way. And I went downstairs and I remember everybody's face when I was, you know, because I reacted, behaved in a different way, they then reacted to me in a different way and, and we had a magical day and it was the first sort of clear indicator that just doing it for 20 minutes upstairs, actually it wasn't as long as that, it was probably about 10 minutes, did work. You were obviously, until that point, very, very down, uh, mm. ridden with guilt about ridden with guilt. walking out of your marriage. Yeah. Work was terrible. I had 20 months out of work, except for three afternoons. I don't tell many people that. It was dire. What do you think would have happened to you had you not found Buddhism? Uh, I think I'd have struggled along, really. I think I'd have gone on searching and maybe not have continued acting because I'd lost all confidence in that way and I don't think I would be blessed with nearly as many friends as I now have or this or this feeling that I can overcome just about well any problem with through chanting as good as that as good as that it is as good as that actually I mean it does that's that's what you that's the feeling that emerges when you chant, you do, you do, we do chant to develop this sort of indestructible state of life, this, this joy. I mean, the purpose, the whole Buddhist philosophy is to overcome suffering and establish real happiness. And you do get this diamond-like happiness that's based not on relative things. It's not based on if the check's in the post or if, if you're happy in your relationship or, or if your job's good. It actually, they're all relative. It's actually, it's actually something much, much deeper. It comes from down there. Everything around you can be awful, and you still feel this, this, this joy and this ability that whatever happens, you will overcome it, and you will create value as well. So it's, it's really good. You're a great salesperson. <laughs> right, I'll tell you. Let's have some more mu music, shall we? You've yeah. chosen as your second uh, song, One Small Voice. Now, why that one? What does that mean to you? I'm very moved by the simplicity and the purity of the lyrics. Um, and the fact that, that even if you think it's just you, just one small voice, you can make a difference. One small voice sang one song all alone, dusk till dawn, pure and clear, soft but strong, calling one and all to sing along. Doesn't any small voice sang one song? All alone, dusk till
Did you smile as much before you were a Buddhist? <laughs> um, I think I have always smiled, yeah, but uh, certainly before I met Buddhism, in, the, in the, the, the year before I met it, no. No, not at all. In fact, I distinctly remember somebody saying to me I'd become a shadow of my former self, and it felt like it. Is it, to put it crudely, is it a smiley, touchy-feely sort of religion? No, not at all. I think it's had quite a lot of bad press, actually. I mean, it's, um, it was called the designer Buddhism a while ago, you know, with Adina from Ab Abfab and everybody chanting for new Porsches and mobile phones. I mean, you, you are encouraged to chant uh, for what you desire. Earthly desires lead you to enlightenment. And there's nothing quite like desire for motivating you as well, you know. But there isn't actually a word in Buddhism for guilt believe it or not. There's words for regret and remorse, sorrow, but, but it doesn't know the concept of guilt. So there isn't guilt about chanting for what you want because sometimes actually we do need physical, material things. And if you take the responsibility of making your life as fulfilled and as happy as possible, then you have a great deal more chance of making everybody else's lives happy too. When have you used chanting to help you professionally? I use it always, uh, but I used it very recently um, when I took over from Judy Finnegan for a week. I remember chanting the day that I had to interview Gordon Brown because he very much wanted to talk about the budget and to keep it very political. And I knew uh, that the editor wanted to get on a much more personal level and to talk about his possible impending marriage or not. And I chanted that we would be able to get onto that subject without compromising him in any way. We came to the interview and it was very political and it was all about the budget. And then suddenly there was a, a tiny moment and I jumped in, some force beyond myself jumped in and said, do we have other congratulations in order? I mean, seeing as I've just may have lost my ring. Uh, I, haven't are you stole, about, I haven't stolen are you it. Haven't stolen, are you about, you know, big rumours, are you about to uh, tie the knot? Well, you know, I think there's been more speculation about that than about my budget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Far be it for me to comment any further, <laughs> Julie. Let's have uh, some more music. Um, you've chosen... Uh, uh, a song called We Will Win. Our, our overall vision is for worldwide peace. We call it Kozen Rufu, which is worldwide peace through the propagation of this Buddhism. And this is, this is a pledge to do that. We come from the north with tears in our eyes. chanting to me I mean can you chant now I mean what do you actually do you put your hands together and you always keep your eyes open and you chant Nam Mio Ho Renge Kyo you say it with me Nam mm. Mio Ho Mio Ho Renge Renge Kyo Kyo that means I devote myself to the mystic law of cause and effect through sound and for all eternity first of all 
all your problems and things may tend to surface. But then you, you, as you chant, you find actually that it becomes much purer and you just, you just sort of try and envelop yourself in Nam Myoho Harenge Kyo, in the words. And it's very, very good to chant with other people as well because their energy propels you forward. And, and it's, it's, it's a very healing sound, it really, really is. You, you actually do feel a sense that anything is possible. Could you live without it? No, not at all. I wouldn't want to live without it. You know, it's, it's, it's so ingrained within me. It brings me so much um, comfort and, and stability. And I'm quite a fly-away person. It's the one thing that, that, that really sort of focuses me, keeps me on course. Terrific. Right, well, your, um, your last uh, choice of song is Dare to Believe. Now, mm. what's the significance of that? This has very, very many happy memories. Um, in 1986, we did a musical called Alice, which was based on Alice in Wonderland. I was a tap dancing chicken, which is one of my more unusual roles, and um, it was directed by a wonderful woman called Sally Miles. And the song is Dare to Believe, and she was extraordinary because she was suffering from motor neurone disease. She was in the last stages of her life, in fact, and she dared to believe that she would be able to achieve her dream of directing us in this musical. Dare to believe there's a song in your heart. Dare to believe in your dreams. Nothing can stop you from playing your part as long as you dare to believe. believe in an afterlife? Yes, very much so. We believe that life is eternal and we uh, incarnate again and again. Um, we don't believe that, you know, this, this time round is, is a penance and we will be born in better circumstances in the great hereafter. I mean, you will be, re you may be reborn in better circumstances, hopefully always with, with the Gohonzon, with Buddhism. Um, but you will be reborn with whatever karma you create, uh, karma being, you know, our actions, what we say, think and do, and the effects uh, that are mani manifested from that. You will be reborn with that karma. Um, personally, I used to suffer hugely from jealousy, and it's something I've chanted about a great deal, and I think I've overcome it. it, it that, that used to really sort of take me over, eat me up, and it's a horrible, horrible emotion. Who or what were you jealous of? I was always jealous of, of the person I was with, that they would go off with somebody else. Were you jealous professionally too? Hugely. I'm still overcoming that one. That's a harder one. You're a fabulous advocate for Buddhism, I must say. But there will remain people, as you know, um, because some people are cynical, who will say, it's all a bit flaky. Yeah, of course they will, and they're entitled to that opinion. All I'd say is, don't knock it till you've tried it. And, and give it a go. I mean, for me, it replaces fear with, with, with genuine hope and stops me coming from a place, uh, sort of a, a, an emotional place that, isn't, that, is, that is ugly and, and irrational at times. Julie Peasgood, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
Jeffrey Archer joins us next week with his choice of hymns at the later time of 11.45.